Welcome to Port Hostage Diplomacy. We work to free hostages and the unjustly detained around the world. Together with their families, we share their stories every week and let you know how you can help bring them home. I'm Darren Nair, and I've had the honor of campaigning with many of these families for years. These are some of the most courageous and resilient people among us, people who have never given up hope, people who will never stop working to reunite their families. And we will be right there by their side until their loved ones are back home. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's meet this week's guest. Jamshid Shamad is a German citizen and a US resident. He and his family live in California. In July 2020, Jamshid was kidnapped in Dubai by agents of Iran's Ministry of Intelligence and taken to Iran, where he's still being held today. His life is in imminent danger for the following reasons. He is currently at risk of being given a death penalty and being executed by the Iranian regime, and he suffers from diabetes, heart disease, and Parkinson's disease. The Iranian authorities are not giving Jamshid the medical care he needs, and if he contracts COVID-19, he could die. The EU Parliament adopted a resolution in July 2021 that urges Iran to immediately drop all charges against all arbitrarily detained EU nationals, including German national Jamshid Shamad. Amnesty International, the human rights charity, has stated he is being arbitrarily detained and has called for his immediate release. Wenzel Mikalski, the German director of Human Rights Watch, has called on the German foreign ministry to secure Jamshid Shamad's release. Iran has a long history of unjustly detaining foreign nationals and dual nationals. This is state-sponsored hostage taking. This is what we call hostage diplomacy. We are joined today by Jamshid's daughter, Giselle Shamad, who is speaking to us from California. Giselle, we're so sorry for what you, your father, and your family are going through. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Darren. Thanks for giving me the time. You're welcome. Can you walk us through what happened to your father? Um, yeah, uh, what happened to him is uh, still a shock to all of us. Um, it's uh, somehow sounds more like out of a movie scene than real life in 2020. Uh, beginning of 2020, um, my dad uh, went on a business trip. Uh, we live here in California. He went on a business trip over. He was supposed to go to India for a short time and uh, to Germany. He is a, um, a software engineer by trade, and he was going to get new contracts over there. Um, as we all know, the pandemic happened, and uh, in the beginning of March, when he had his trip, he was supposed to be three weeks and back. Um, he went to India with my brother, and uh, the pandemic happened, and India, the complete country, shut down. They shut their borders, and uh, they announced that they will reopen in a few weeks, and they didn't reopen, and then they announced that again and again, over and over, and my dad and my brother were stuck there for almost three months. Um, once the borders opened, uh, my dad and my brother took the first flight that they can afford. Uh, the flights were super expensive at that time. The first flights that they can afford went from um, Dubai to Amsterdam. And then from Amsterdam, he, they were supposed to come back to the United States. Um, my brother was allowed to board the flight. And my dad was not allowed to. The reason is that my brother is a permanent resident of the United States and my, my dad lived here on a visa. And visa holders, because of the pandemic, were not allowed back into the country. So they told him there, go to the country of your citizenship, which is Germany, and go to the embassy there and go to the consulate and um, try to get your visa approved again to re-entry into the country so you can join your family. And this is what he did at that time. I think it was uh, June or July um, that he went back to Germany and um, they would not give him uh, an appointment right away. Like the, the appointments were like far in advance, like month in advance, and he already wasted so much time 
in India and uh, making so much debt, you know, like living in this hotel and like trying to get medication over there and all of those things that people had to deal with during the pandemic. And so he decided he would go back to India because the country opened back up and he would um, go back to his business partners and start at least uh, making some money while waiting for an appointment at the consulate. Um, the first flight that he was able to get went from uh, Frankfurt in Germany to um, uh, Dubai. And then from Dubai, he was supposed to take another flight. There were no direct flights at that time. It was very hard to get direct flights. Uh, they were very expensive and very rare. So he went to Dubai and then from there, he was supposed to go back to Mumbai. Um, July uh, 28th, if I'm not mistaken, was the last time that my mom talked to him in his hotel room uh, via uh, video chat. So he, she was able to see him. She, she saw that he's in uh, Dubai. She was wondering, why, why are you there? I thought you're going back to Mumbai. And he said, yeah, I'm just catching another flight here. I'm going to be here for a few days and then taking the next flight is, is coming up. That was the last time she saw him and she knew she was, he was well. Um, they have been talking every single day, either through video chat or through uh, text messages or calls through the time that he was uh, um, there in the pandemic. And after this video call, there was complete radio silence. My dad would not answer his phone. He would not respond to any of the text messages. He would not respond to the phone calls or anything. We did not know where he was or what was happening to him for two days. After two days, my mom received a message, just a plain text message saying, I'm okay, I will call you or I will, I, I, I will, I will contact you in, in Persian. And that was already a very big warning sign because my dad would not just ignore all of her phone calls and like the worries with a, with a blunt text message. The very next day, which was August 1st, um, we were woken up by uh, friends and family members that told us, um, turn on the news, go on YouTube. You can see a clip there uh, of, of your husband. That's what they told my mom. And she went on YouTube and she saw that clip that everybody has seen now. My dad in the hands of the Islamic regime, uh, blindfolded, stating his name, uh, forced to commit to crimes that he did not com uh, that he did not do, and that's how we found out where he apparently was. That he had been kidnapped, that he had been somehow taken to Iran, which we assume uh, still nobody has explained that to us. But that's what, when we found out. And uh, at that time, um, I was uh, a nurse uh, working here in the hospital during the pandemic. I, we had a lot of stress here. I was pregnant with my first baby. Uh, five months pregnant at that time. My family first did not want to tell me, but they, they figured we have to let her know. So the shock of seeing my dad there, I will never forget that. We, we thought that my dad was uh, dead at that moment when we saw this video because it looked like one of those videos that the Hezbollah shows before they do a beheading or something. It looked very like, like, like a death sentence pretty much. And um, uh, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. And the backstory of my dad is also that the Islamic regime tried in the last 10 years to assassinate him several times. And so when we saw this video, we were 99% sure that this was the last time we would see my dad. This was not the, the, this was the end of it. He, they had him, they showed him on TV, and now he was dead somewhere. And we cried and we cried and then we got ourselves together and we thought, okay, we have to do something now. We, we can't just sit here and wait. And nobody was explaining anything to us. Like, there's no way that you can contact the Islamic regime and ask if your loved one is there, if he was taken. Like not, nothing, we, we, not, we knew nothing, but that he was in uh, Dubai uh, in his hotel room and then the radio silence. And then all of a sudden he was on TV with that video. So we assumed he's in Iran and we contacted the, the German embassy because he's a German national, we're all German nationals. We contacted uh, anybody here in America that we could find, lawyers, everything, the politicians, uh, uh, US, I don't know, government officials, any, anybody that we could think of, uh, NGOs. Um, uh, I, I opened my first Twitter account at that time. I didn't have a Twitter account and started just blurting stuff out like, hey, this is what happened to my dad. We need help. We don't know what's going on. And uh, that's how it started. And um, now it has been over 500 days that he has been kept there as a hostage. Uh, he has been in um, 
a horrible condition because first of all, he is uh, isolated. He is not in a prison with other people. Every time he is allowed to call, um, he tells us there's nobody there. He is by himself. So that's, that's isolation for 500 plus days. Um, he is, of course, sick. He had severe Parkinson. That's why my brother went with him. Like he's very, very sick. He needs his medication on time every three hours. I don't know if they're providing him his medication. He gets uh, very bad pains in his body when he doesn't get it on time. I don't know if they're providing him any food. I don't know if he has access to outside, if he can see anybody, if he can see doctors. Um, he does not get access to a lawyer. We cannot get our lawyer through to him. They're giving him regime lawyers that are absolutely against this case. And, um, and uh, in this last year, I think he was able to call us two times or three times, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I did not speak to him since, I think, March. Uh, March of 2021. And um, uh, this is not this is not a prisoner. A prisoner has rights. A prisoner is allowed to make phone calls. A prisoner um, is under arrest for a certain charge. There is no charges against him. There is no there is nothing against him. Nobody tells us what he has done, why he's there, where he is. So this is an ongoing kidnapping and, and hostage taking. And um, I can't believe it's taking so long and we, we have reached nothing, but, but we really need help and we need to get moving with this. I'm so sorry you and your family are going through this, Giselle. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned that there were issues with the lawyer. So you had to use what you call a regime lawyer. Now, mm -hmm. Iran's judicial system is notoriously unfair and rigged. Can you just elaborate further on what you mean by a regime lawyer and uh, yes. so what are the consequences of this to your father? Yes. Um, this was, this was news to us too. I mean, like we, we heard, of course, uh, I, I didn't grow up in, in, in Iran, but we heard that the um, judicial system was, uh, was rigged and you have some understanding of it, but once you're in it and you need to get through it, you just see how messed up the system is. So, um, First thing that we tried to do was get a lawyer, any kind of lawyer on his case. Um, we asked the German embassy, they gave us a list of lawyers that they worked with before and that they thought we could contact. Uh, we started contacting them and 99% of them said they cannot take his case because it's a danger to them. So you have to imagine a country where you as a lawyer, you cannot represent anybody because if the regime doesn't like your client that you're representing, they're going to put you into prison. They're going to charge you. They're going to uh, 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 maybe assassinate you. They're going to do something to you personally. So you cannot take a case because you're afraid for your life. So that was the first thing that we were like, okay. And then... Um, uh, the ones that were willing to take his case or, or were brave enough to take his case or were strong enough to take his case said, um, we're not allowed on his, on his case. We didn't understand that. And then one of the lawyers, uh, sp uh spelled it out for me and said, there is a list of, uh, lawyers that are working with the government. I call them regime lawyers. And they are only approved to take certain cases, which are called security cases. And my dad falls into a security case. And uh, those those lawyers work with the government, the government that that took my dad, and those are the only pe people who can represent him. So, you know, that is no representation. Um, we said we don't want any of those. We we finally got a lawyer that would take his case, and we we sent her to the prison. Um, she was told the first time that he is not there. Uh, Jamshita Sharma doesn't exist in this prison. She went to, right to Ebin prison where most of the political prisoners are um, kept. Uh, the next time she was told he is there, but she doesn't have access. Then they told her again, she, he's not there. He's in a different prison. He's not even in Iran. They kept changing the story and not getting her any access. In one of the few phone calls that my dad was allowed, he told us that they put a lawyer on his case. That uh, lawyer was Dabir Darya Begi, a regime lawyer, which was also the regime lawyer that um, defended Ruho Lazam. Uh, by defended, I mean he got him the death sentence and he was executed a few months after my dad was taken. So we did not want this guy on this case. We talked to my dad. We told him what happened to Ruho Lazam, and he said, I don't want this guy. Thankfully, that guy was taken off the case. 
the next regime lawyer that they put on the case, his name was um, Reza Dordizadeh. And uh, again, we said we don't want we don't want a regime lawyer on that case. The only thing that they do is they work with the regime together to get you to um, sign away your life, like admit to any kinds of crimes, and they they tell you that they're going to make a deal. They're going to they know the the um, the judge. They're going to get you out of fear. They're going to get you a better sentence if you just commit to these crimes or if you just go on this show. And they they made some shows with him where he's where he's standing there and he's he's uh, admitting to crimes and and all. All that kind of propaganda that is involved in that. And, and uh, as a reward, they give you a, a good deal, which is usually not a good deal, just a way to, to get you to the death sentence. So again, we explained that to my dad and my dad said, take him off the case. And we tried to take him off the case, but this guy does not want to get off the case. In fact, um, my dad would not call us for, I think, three months. And in the last phone call that we had when the uh, regime lawyer was on the case, he had a very heavy cough. So we were very worried that he might have gotten COVID in, in, in this time. And he would not call us. My mom was very worried. So she called this regime lawyer and she told him, are you, are you able to see my husband? Do you know where he is? Is he alive? Can you get access to him? And can you make him call us? And he said, yes. And sure enough, my dad called and he was okay and he, he did not have COVID and he sounded a, a bit better. My mom called this lawyer again uh, just to thank him, like, thank you for, for going there and making him call us. And that's when he told her, well, um, by the way, I'm his lawyer, I'm on his case. And um, his case is very long, it's 10 files long. And my mom asked him, what are the charges? And he said, well, I can't tell you, I haven't looked through it. And she said, why haven't you looked at it? Well, it's, it's, it's too big of a case. All I can do is stand next to him in court and try to defend him. But if you want me to spend any more time and go through his case and really build a defense, I need a, I need a team and I need $250,000 from you to do that. So $250,000, we don't make that much in a year. I don't, I know surgeons that don't make that much in a year in America. And this guy wanted that just to do his job, which we don't even want him to do. We didn't even want him on the case. The regime put him on the case. My dad doesn't want him on the case. And now that he is on the case and he claims to be the only person having access to him and being able um, to, to get him to call us, he wanted $250,000 from us just to do his job, just to look through his file, just to build a defense. So I don't know if you can see, but this system is more than messed up. This system is, there, there is no justice in it. There, the, the, it's not a justice system. It's a, it's a joke to call this a justice system. It's just a facade. It's just something that they put up there. The only hope that we have and why we're even talking to this lawyer is they told us in the trial phase, when this goes to trial, uh, the regime has to allow any lawyer on the case. So if we can get these lawyers off the case and my dad makes it to the trial, we can get an independent lawyer on the case who can go and see him. And that's the only thing we want, somebody to go and see him. He doesn't need even a defense. We haven't seen our dad for since 2000 since the beginning of 2000. We want somebody to go there and see him and physically check him and see if he's okay, if, if he's been tortured, where in the world he is, which uh, facility he's at. So that's why we want a, a lawyer there, not even to do any justice, not even to defend him, just to go and physically see him. Sorry, you mentioned you haven't seen your dad since 2000, which are you talking 2021, 2020? Uh, sorry, 2020. Yes, that's what I meant. 2020, when he first uh, when he first uh, went on the uh, his business trip to India. Okay, now I understand. Um, yeah. So, to understand why this is happening to your father, can you talk to us a bit about your father's background? Because I know that your family fled Iran in 1983 and migrated to Germany. In 2003, your family moved to California, which is where you live now. Yes. As you said earlier, there was an assassination attempt. So I read this from your website, freesharmat.org. In 2009, there was an assassination attempt on your father. And according to the information on that website, the assassin got cold feet and turned himself in. So obviously there is a backstory to this. Can you just oh, elaborate yes. further? Yes, uh, without going 
too much into detail. I can tell you that my family has always been politically active. They have always been defenders of human rights. They've always been very outspoken. And um, when I was born um, uh, after the revolution, um, they decided to put that on hold for a while because they had a family now and because as you know um it is dangerous as parents to be politically active uh, uh iranian uh, being politically active whether you're inside the country or outside the country they have been assassinations from the regime all over europe and um they decided while their children grow up they're going to be just parents stay out of politics as much as they can and raise us safely, which they did. Um, by the time we were in our teens and 20s, um, my dad decided to move to America. And uh, when he came over here, we were uh, having a, a normal life in the beginning. And then he started to be interested in politics again, because he just put that on hold for some time while his children were growing up. The community here in LA, the Persian community is really big. There are like lots of TV stations, lot of politically active people here. And he looked at everything and, and he found a group that he was very interested in. The, um, uh, it was through the Fulat Fund back then with uh, the, um, it's called Anjuman Shahi, which is the Kingdom Assembly of Iran. So he was following them. They had a TV station. He was listening to them and he got very interested. Since by trade he's a software engineer, he offered them to um, create a website for them and all of their material that they were publishing on TV, um, he was able to put it on the website and like pretty much have an archive of everything over there. And that's how it started uh, for him. The um, founder of this group uh, disappeared in the early 2000s. Um, we assume that he was taken hostage, he was kidnapped somehow. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail because nothing is clear about that case either. Um, my dad, uh, having that website built for them, um, was at that time still anonymous. Uh, nobody knew that it was my dad. Uh, he built the website, he put it on his portal, he put it on his um, server. Uh, we don't know if it was a security glitch back then or if it was cyber attacked or something, but uh, the name of the server got exposed and the name of the server is my dad's company, Sharmat Computing. So therefore his name, Sharmat, was exposed and my dad was no longer anonymous and anonymously um, political. Um, at that time we were in big, big shock because me and my mom were actually about to go to, to Iran, to travel to Iran and see some of her family members over there. We knew that we were in great danger. The regime announced on national TV that my dad and this group is the enemy of the state and they're the number one enemy and they they ask America for his extradition. And we knew we could no longer go to Iran and visit our family. We knew we were in danger over here and my dad knew that. But um, I don't know if you knew my dad, he always got into when he got into really bad situations, he would try to turn it to the best. Like instead of like being desperate and what we did and we were crying about not seeing our family, he said, well, now that I'm exposed, I might as well use my face to help these people. So he went public and he opened a, um, uh, a satellite uh, radio station, Tonda, um, Radio Tonda. He was speaking on that radio station on behalf of this group. He was publishing news. He was putting like all of their stuff on there uncensored. Nothing was censored. Everything straight out of Iran from political active groups in Iran coming in there. And that was a big, big thorn in the eyes of the regime because political activists inside of Iran cannot show their face. They cannot say what they're doing. They cannot say who they are, who they're working with, what they want to accomplish, what their goals are, nothing of that. Even, even being associated in some way with a political group in Iran means a death sentence for you. So people in Iran who are politically active need an outlet outside of the country. That's where all of those dissidents uh, come into play that are in America or in Europe and are, that are helping. And my dad provided this portal for them. Since that time that he became public, Till now, we have been under attack, whether it be cyber attack, whether it be threat calls, whether um, uh, uh, people trying to lure him out of the country for reasons, um, people trying to meet him inside the country, um, pretending to be part of, uh, of the dissident group. Um, and of course, like 
threats to our body, which was uh, several assassination attempts, but one of them went public, so this one I can talk about, which was in 2009, where the Islamic regime sent an assassin to Los Angeles, to our house. Uh, he hired somebody here to um, make it look like an accident. Uh, they, they had a truck. They were supposed to run over my dad. They also had guns in case they would miss or my dad would survive. They would kill him, but the plan was to run him over. Thankfully, that was caught in time by the FBI and uh, they were exposed. Uh, the, the person that was hired to run over the truck, he chickened out at the last minute and went to the local police here. Uh, they already knew that guy, that um, Mohammed Reza um, uh, Sadernia, um, who, who came from the regime. He brought the money. He, he hired this person. He went uh, to trial. He went to jail here for a year until he um, was released uh, to Iran to see his uh, sick father, which we think was a, a, a swap, a, a prisoner swap at that time. So that, that's, that's what happened in 2009. Uh, after that, there were several other attempts and several other um, uh, places where they wanted to take my dad out, hijack the website, uh, try to find out who these political activists are inside of Iran, try to ident identify them, um, make sure they're silenced, make sure nothing gets out, and of course, to kill my dad. So that, in a nutshell, is the, is the backstory that we have for the last 10 years, at least, of terror from the regime. And now in, in, this, in this horrible pandemic where everybody is threatened, feared for their life because of a virus, my dad was taken and, and he's, he's there now. So having your father being taken hostage by the regime and not being able to speak to him, not knowing how he's doing right now, whether he's getting the medical care he needs, is obviously very traumatic to you and your family. So how have you and your mother and your brother been coping? Um, we haven't been coping very well, uh, to, to tell you the truth. Um, I mean... Uh, I don't know how to say it, but it, our life is upside down. Our life is not the same. Um, I can't work at this time. I mean, I'm, I'm a first time mom anyways. I'm, I'm with my child right now, um, but I'm in my head so much. Uh, I had severe and still have severe depression, uh, trauma from the time that this happened, of course. And, and um, of course, that's all packed with postpartum depression and everything together, but to the point where, where it's really not good and uh, seeking help right now. But um, I'm just a daughter. I mean, I can't imagine what's going on in the head of my mother. My mother and my father, they have been together for 40 years and they have been inseparable. It's, it's a deep love. It's a great relationship. They've been partners in everything that they do. And to think that she wakes up every day and he's not next to her, I, I can't even imagine that. I catch myself all of the time, all of the day, uh, thinking about the worst scenarios that can happen to him. I mean, if you know that he is in a certain place, like, for example, Evan Prison in this cell, and this is what, what people say about this cell, it is still horrible and it's still bad. But not knowing where he is gives you all of these ho horrible ideas that you can just imagine yourself and it makes it worse and not knowing how he's doing how, when he's allowed to call how they're torturing him i mean the psychological torture alone of not being able to talk to anybody not to being able to see anybody for a month for years it, it is is horrifying we were on quarantine and we were all like suffering so much and being so depressed because we couldn't go out you know like and into the public imagine you're in a cell for for so long imagine you can't you can't get your food, you can't get your medication, you have physical pains. It's just horrifying just to think about that. And I don't know if that is the only kind of torture that they're doing to him because of his political involvement and because they want to get to other people. So I assume that there is more physical torture and we can't see his body. So I don't know how he looks. I know in one of his phone calls that he said that he lost so much weight. I think it was uh, 40 pounds of weight. And my dad is, is six feet uh, six two, six three, or six two tall, and he weighs about sixty kilograms. He said, which is nothing. That, that's that's how much I weigh. So he lost so much weight there. He has pains. He I, he. In one of the phone calls, he told us that his teeth has been pulled out. I don't know if they're doing dental procedures there. 
if that's a form of torture, we, we, we can't understand, we can't pinpoint it, you know, it's just bits of information that are coming through in the phone calls that he's allowed. And in those phone calls that he's allowed, which are like every so many months, um, there are guards present. His interrogators are are present right next to him. So you can imagine like the truth is something and what he tells us is something completely else because he could not tell us what was going on there. I'm sorry you're going through this. If it's any consolation, know that you're not alone. A lot of people are with you on this and want to help. So stay strong. Um, what support have you received from the German and US governments today? Because your father is a German citizen and he's lived in the US for 17 years, right? So what kind of support, if any, have you received from both governments? Um, yeah, the support that we have received is, uh, Formally, is it's it's great support. Formally, the German government came right from the beginning and told us, "We, your dad is a German citizen. We're one hundred percent behind him. We do everything that we can while we're there. We're we're talking to everybody on the highest levels. We will get to him. We will try to get to him. We will do this. We will do that." From day one, they've been there. They, they invited us here to the German consulate. We talked to them here. We talked to the Auswärtige Amt every day, uh, not every day, sorry, uh, continuously. And, um, that was, that was great. I mean, we, we saw the support, uh, the, the Americans not directly to us. Um, they, they did not say that they, they can support him because he's not a, a um, a U.S. citizen, but to our lawyers and everything, we know that they they are still supporting us, and we're, we're working with the agencies over here as well, uh, and they ha they are supportive of us as well. Um, but, and this is a really big but, looking at the last year and at what these governments have really accomplished, um, we can say that either they did nothing or whatever they did was not enough because. After one year, we still don't know where he is. We still don't know what the charges are. We still don't know how he was taken from Dubai to Iran. How is this even possible? Um, we don't know anything that we didn't know one year ago. So, so looking at the results, there has been absolutely no change. And um, deep in our hearts, we refuse to believe that this is all that they can do. I mean, Germany is a big trade partner of, of, of Iran. We think that if they wanted to, they, they, they could at least get somebody through to him. They could at least get somebody there and tell us, this is where he is. This is how he looked to us. This is what they're doing to him, or these are the charges. Nothing has been done of that sort. And um, we're hoping, uh, with, a, with a new government and everything forming, that this will change and hopefully get to the better. So um, hopefully for the future. I know there are JCPOA negotiations going on in Vienna. Germany is a part of that. What do you think they should be saying to the Iranian delegation, if anything? Mm -hmm. what, what they should be saying is absolutely no deals unless we're talking about human rights first. You, I, I cannot imagine talking about business, talking about nuclear power, weapon, whatever it is, while people are being being taken hostage, while people are being robbed of their rights, be, citizens of that country, I cannot just come to a table and and expect a fair deal with you when you're just reaching over the border and, and grabbing my citizens and and doing whatever you want to them. That that is unacceptable. So, the very least is talking about human rights, releasing all all of the political prisoners that they're keeping hostage right now. And then we can talk about anything else. Before that, I don't understand what they're doing. I don't understand how they can even be at a table. This is this is unacceptable. This is not right. This is inhumane. We have to understand that human rights are so much more worth than anything else. And, and that's what I expect from them. So when you said all political prisoners, there are mm -hmm. at least 16 known foreign and dual nationals being held hostage in Iran. There are four from the US, there are f three or four from the UK, there are two from France, there are two from Germany, not just your father. There are two from Austria. And again, I say known 
hostages. Yes. There are definitely more people. Now, given that Germany, your father is not the only German hostage in Iran, and the fact that the EU parliament has adopted a resolution calling for the uh, Iranian regime to release these individuals, doesn't that, I mean, that I, I completely agree with you uh, as part mm -hmm. of the negotiations, this should definitely be brought up. I also appreciate that a lot of the national security types are going to say, well, the purpose of these negotiations are to make sure Iran doesn't get the nuclear bomb. But, and I can appreciate that if you're, if you, if they're only thinking about this in terms of numbers or people affected, but at the same time, these hostages matter. They need to be brought home. Um, and even though nobody doubts the intentions of most of these people negotiating in Vienna right now from the U S or from Germany, but it's key. It's important for us to keep reminding them that there are human lives, there are German lives, American lives at stake right now, and they're suffering. Their families are suffering. And as hard as it is, this, they need to be brought back home. They did it once before with Jason Rezaian during the first round of nuclear talks. They can do it again. So what can journalists and news outlets do to help? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about what you just said. I mean, um, it's not just about my father. That's what, that's why I keep saying all of them have to come home. It's, it's my father is due to me. He's not due to many other people. It is about the principle. It's about the principle of taking a human being and playing the, with his life and playing the, with his life as a, as a, as a political card. And, um, of course you're right. I mean, they're, they're talking about nuclear, nuclear bombs and they want, don't want to have to, uh, to have, for them to have nuclear weapons, but um, we don't even have to go into nuclear weapons. I mean, if you are able to reach out into different countries and kidnap people, um, assassinate people there, that is already a violation of human rights. I mean, why would you expect somebody um, to, to, to follow uh, a, a nuclear deal if they can't even stick to international law, if to human rights laws? I mean, that even if their interest is for them not to have nuclear weapons, they should put this first because that's the very first principle that people have to follow. International law, don't break rules, don't go into other borders and kidnap people, don't, don't assassinate people in other countries. I mean, that, that, that should be number one. Once you can adhere to these normal rules, now we can talk about other stuff. That should be the number one. But what, what um, your question was about media outlets and what people can do, Media and people have the biggest influence of this. I mean, every time when I post something on Twitter, people are telling me the government doesn't care about people. There's nothing we can do. Da, 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 da. I know that governments obviously do not care about all of those things or seemingly do not place a, a, a lot of their value onto, onto human rights laws and all of those things. But that's because of us. We, we elect these people. We elect these governments, at least in the free world, and they do what we want as, as a group, as people. And if, if we show them that human rights are important to us individually and as a group and as a society, then they have to act on that. If we show them that we don't care about human rights, why should they care in their negotiations? Then they will go and talk about business. So we first have to show we care about human rights by posting about this, by uh, 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 being engaged, going to your representatives, talking about this, um, liking, just, just freaking liking a, a post about this, uh, coming forward, sharing these stories, uh, what, what you are doing, for example, podcasts, all of those things to bring these stories out. Because I honestly, I did not know, even though my dad was politically active, I did not know that hostage taking was a thing. I did, I absolutely did not know that. And that is not because I didn't look for it. That is because it is so underexposed because be, really you have to be in that, in that scenario to, to look for it and know that this is going on. And, and we need people to pay attention to this and to spread this and being more engaged. And you don't know how much of an influence that makes. I mean, when the media picked up my father's case, when you back then were helping me and getting me to, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and all of those things that you, thankfully you, you got me through because I couldn't get through to them. My dad was calling us almost every month. And now that it has almost like, 
ebbed off and then media is not picking up that much anymore and people are not that interested in it anymore because it's an old story, so to say. Um, he hasn't called for four months now. So you think you, you, don't, you don't make a change. You think simple people don't make a change. They make a huge change. I can see it with my dad. I can see that he is calling us and he is well, that he's been treated well, being allowed at least more phone calls or that he's not. And what you're doing by helping us, by bringing this story out, is securing his life. Every time this gets shared, every time this gets spoken about, you're making sure that my dad and other people that are kept their hostage are kept alive and hopefully kept well. And that is a huge power that you have in your hands that you don't even know about. So I'm thankful to everybody who shares that. I'm thankful to all of those people that reached out to me and are still reaching out to me and doing that because you have a tremendous power that politicians don't even have because we, we can make these changes together. But you have to start and you have to do these little changes and to help us. No, I absolutely agree with you. Um, as the saying goes, the most powerful office in government is the office of citizen. For members of the public in the U.S., um, what can they do? I mean, uh, what should they write to their local congressman, uh, their senator, or even to the White House? What should they say? Mm -hmm. Tell them how you feel about it. Tell, tell them, first of all, your questions. How is this possible that people are kept hostage? How is this in the 21st century possible? What are you as my representative doing about this? How are you voting to, to, to prevent this? How are you getting these people back? If this happens to me or my loved one or my local news agent or, or, or human rights person, how are you going to get this person back? What can we do? What can we change? They, can, they don't have to come up with a solution. They can write them and ask these questions that we all have. What are you doing about it? What, why, why do you not do anything about it? And um, that alone triggers people to react. I mean, just like posting questions on, on Twitter, I saw, I saw journalists posting questions over and over again to the press and the press started picking this up. And then when the press reacted, the government agencies reacted. So just whatever you feel in your heart, if you feel, hey, I don't feel secure, I feel totalitarian, uh, totalitarian regimes can come and rob us of our rights and I don't feel safe, post this. Talk about that. As long as we're talking, as long as we have a dialogue, that's all I'm asking for. You, you don't have to say anything that you don't want to say. If you care about human rights, if you care about the principle that me and you can stand anywhere in the world and talk without being, being shut down or, or, or robbed of our rights, speak up about this. That's all I want. On the point of writing to politicians, I saw your name in that letter that American families wrote with the help of the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation to President Biden. Could you just elaborate further on that letter and why you participated in that? And what are you expecting from President Biden? Um, that's a good question. So um, from the beginning, pretty much, um, when this happened to my dad, uh, I immediately reached out and saw there were so many other families that this not exact story, but very similar story, story happened to, and they have loved ones that are taken by, by a totalitarian regime, and they are hostage families. And I reached out to them, and I wanted them to, to join so we're all together and we can do everything together and learn from each other, and I thought that was a great idea. But talking to most of these families, I saw that most of them were terrified most of them did not want to respond. If they responded, they did not want to be part of a group or anything. Or they, 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 were, they were afraid to do a lot of things. Even speaking out on, on social media was, was a big threat to them. And they're right to do so because it is terrifying. The Iran puts threat on the, on the family. You are terrified every time I'm talking in public or I'm doing an interview or I'm doing a podcast or I'm putting up a tweet or saying anything in public. I'm terrified for my life. I'm terrified for my mom, for my brother, for my daughter, for my husband. I'm terrified for anybody who's around me. And rightly so, because they, they put threats out and they are terrifying and they are threatening to harm you or your heart, your loved one over there. I'm not saying not to be afraid. I'm saying even though we all are so terrified, the only thing that we can do is to do the right thing as a group because that makes us stronger, because that gives us a, a voice all together instead of me trying to advocate for my dad and so-and-so advocating for their mom or, or brother or daughter or whatever. 
all together advocating for for these hostages, we can have a bigger voice. And that's 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 what I tried to do. And that's what I liked about the Foley Foundation and this letter that we all came together as a group, as family members, and we have a bigger voice. So whether it's the, the President Biden or President Trump or any other president after that, we expect the same thing from them. We expect them to to hear us out. We expect them to have decency and and to advocate for human rights and to let us know what they're going to do to bring our loved ones back how are they going to do that keep a dialogue open and then act upon it show us what they have done and i expect this from the americans and i expect this from the german government as well support your people support you support us, we have been victims, as we are victims too of a crime. We are suffering here too as the families, not just our loved ones over there, obviously robbed of all of their rights. We here want to get together and we want to make an impact on, on the governments and get something done. Giselle, we're almost at the end of our interview. Is there anything else you'd like to mention? I just want to take a second to um, thank everybody who has actually reached out in this time and helped us out of the goodness of their heart. Um, you, Darren, are one of them who came forward and asked us, what do we need? How can I help you? And you helped us so much to get through to, to the NGOs. Um, our, our, our lawyer, um, Jason, um, uh, and the Global Liberty Alliance, which is this NGO here, they have helped us. They are trying to get us through to the working group of arbitrary um, detention. And, um, so many reporters who who did not just do their job of covering the story, but constantly check back with us, see how we're doing, getting updates from us. Like these are really people who you can tell they're doing it from the bottom of their hearts. And you people are very rare, but you don't know how much we appreciate you. We don't know how happy we are that you people are here. Please continue what you're doing. Um, you don't appreciate it until the moment you really, really need help. And you see that this world is divided into people who don't care and people who do care and do act upon what's in their heart. And I'm so glad that I, even in those dark times, had the chance to found, find these people and continue my relationship with them. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody, who after this, watching this, will come forward and join us. We appreciate anything that, to, that you do. Um, we need your help. We're alone here. We need everybody who can help. Even the smallest little word uh, can, can make our day. Um, you can find us on Twitter. You can, um, my, my brother uh, made a website. Uh, it's called freesharma.org. You can go on there. Um, and uh, just reach out and uh, we can talk. And thank you so much for watching this. And thank you, Daring, for giving me the time to speak here. You're very welcome, Giselle. Uh, I'm honored to help. Um, so for pe so you, you mentioned briefly, um, for people who want to keep up with your campaign, there's the freesharmat.org website. Let me just and check. And you can always find me through my, the hashtag freejamshitsharmat. Sure. And uh, you have a Twitter account as well. It's uh, What's your Twitter account handle? Uh, Giselle.Charmat. Uh, okay, great. Um, Giselle, we'll, as I said before, um, as I've told you many times, we'll be right here campaigning by your side until your father comes back home. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Darren. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Pod Hostage Diplomacy. We're not just a podcast, we're a community. If you're on Twitter and would like to post a message of solidarity to the families or have any questions for us, please tweet it using the hashtag Pod Hostage Diplomacy and we'll get back to you. If you like what we're trying to do, please do consider supporting the show financially. You can do this using the support the show link in the description of this podcast episode. We're grateful for any contributions, no matter how small. Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back next week. Take care.